Actually, sorry. I just, I never, I'm never very good at, like, the nuts and bolts or, like, the, here's the, like, someone said, you can be an MC at, like, an event. And I'm like, I don't do MC very, things very well. And they said, well, are you kidding? You always get up and speak. I'm like, yeah, because I know what I'm going to say. MCs are like, okay, so please, the bathrooms are to the right. No, they're to the left. I'm sorry. Like, I just get so flustered, so I apologize for that. There's going to be microphones right there. It's, this is going to last about 45 minutes. And then there's roughly going to be anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes worth of co uh, questions, if you have them. And if they're not, then we get to have a little break, which is, that's great too, and just get to hang out. Um, the, whole, the whole concept of this, this, this time together is, um, and also, sorry, another pause. I'm not very good at it, as I just said. As I just said. Um, two little warnings. One, I have a tendency to speak really quickly. I will fight that tendency as, as with everything I've got, but I'm really just, I, that's, I, that's my default. My default speed is times two, so I'm really sorry. Um, I want to fight it so that it's more clear. Secondly is, um, thank you for being here. Because, I mean, because you could have gone anywhere. I, but, I, <laughs> no, you guys, I'm thanking you. <laughs> um, because there's I actually, I wanted to be at all the other talks too, so. <laughs> but, but thank you, because I, I know that probably you're here, the reason you're here is because this matters to you. Um, and what we're going to be talking about today, of course, is, is, as it says in the description, it's the third way. And as I said last night, where that came from, where that concept, that idea, that thought, that title even came from, is from, again, personally, in my own life, is... Someone, as I said, that I love very, very much who said, this is who I am. I, I'm a gay man, and your two options are this. You either accept and endorse, celebrate every decision I make with this regard, or that means you hate me. And, and then it was kind of this, like, okay, is the, as I said last night, are those our only two options? Because I would rather have a real relationship with you. I'd rather, because think about this, if we, if we stop. I think when it comes to this topic, again, it's not just a topic, but when it comes to this realm of human relationships, many times, oftentimes, we can lose our common sense. We can forget what common sense is. And so if by the end of this presentation you're like, well, all that was just common sense, then I did my job. <laughs> because this should be stuff that we already kind of automatically know. But for some reason, because it has to do with a really highly charged, and really sensitive area where we want to be compassionate people, we want to be good people, we don't want to do the wrong thing, that sometimes we just forget, like, oh, that's just common sense. That's, you mean just treat people like people? Yes. That's, if that, so that was the spoiler. All I'm going to say is treat people like people. So if you now want to go to the other talk... <laughs> Like, you, you have an out now, because they're going to say more profound things than some of the other sessions. But that's, 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 it. that's what it's going to be. I'm going to break it down into, like, six or seven Bs. Um, I don't want to say Beatitudes, but there's, it's already taken. <laughs> but it comes down to a real relationship. Real relationships with real people involve real conflict. Real relationships with real people involve real conflict that you get to have your opinion, and I get to have my opinion. That you get to choose to live your life how you want to live your life, and I get to choose to endorse it or not. And we still get to be in relationship with each other. And this is one of those things, again, sometimes we just forget that that's true. As, um, as my dad said, as a family member had said, um, I just want you to accept me. We're going to talk about acceptance a little bit today. And my dad had said, he said, because <laughs> I know some of you are, are parents, you, your, your son, your daughter, brother, sister, someone in your life, maybe yourself, experience same-sex attraction, that my dad had said, well, no parent, no parent accepts everything their child does. He says, well, some parents do, but no good parent does. <laughs> that no good parent accepts everything their child chooses. No parent endorses everything that their child chooses because not everything a child chooses, whether they're little or old, is good for them. And that's our starting point. This is, the question is kind of like this. Is there room to say, I don't, agree with every, I don't agree with every one of your decisions, but I want to be in your life. 
because as Catholic Christians, that's our call. We don't have to agree with every decision someone makes, but I want to be in your life. Why? Because I, I want to convert you? Well, kind of, but not really. That's the initial point is that. The initial point is I actually, I just care about you. I like you. I, I, I want to be in your life. I want you in my life. Is it one of your rules that I have to accept you or else you reject me? It's going to be one of the questions that has to come up onto the table, but that's one of the B things, so I don't want to jump ahead. Here's where I want to start. Where I want to start is this. It's from the letter of James, chapter 1. It says this, verse 26. If anyone thinks they're religious, but does not bridle their tongue and deceives his heart, his religion is vain. If anyone thinks they're religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, his religion is vain. And I bring that up because of this, because our words are really important. And yet sometimes we think, well, no, I mean, my, here's the thing. We're going to be talking about people who experience same-sex attraction. And sometimes we can categorize that into like, well, those people who experience such attraction. Here we are at a Catholic conference, but there's those people, those people who experience same-sex attraction. Let's talk about those people who experience same-sex attraction. And, and our conversation becomes like, well, there's us here, and then there's them out there. There's us here, and we're kind of like really on fire with the faith, and we're kind of living our lives right, but then, then there's those people out there. And we really want to talk about them. And how can we be good people to them? And how can we love them? And how can we be in their lives? And we can make it into this us and them kind of situation. If we do that, if we make this whole conversation about them, then we're, we're completely doing it wrong. Because this is not an us and them issue. There's only us. There's only us. And one of the, the points of division we have is we have this sense of like, well, no, there's those special sins out there. Those special problems out there that, no, I mean, really, I mean, think about it. Like, yes, of course, everyone's broken. Fine, Father, whatever. But... What about, but this is like a really big deal. Okay, yes, I don't deny that. But that's why I wanted to start with James. If anyone does not bridle their tongue, but deceives their heart, your religion is in vain. That means for all of you who struggle with gossip, and you call it venting. I'm just, I'm just sharing, I'm just sharing. Your religion is vain. Your faith is worthless. Anyone who struck, who, 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 well, it comes back to complaining. You complain a lot. If you don't bridle your tongue with it, your religion is worthless. The person always has to be grumpy and say well, everything they're thinking. Your religion is worthless. Just want to let you know. Because this whole thing is like not, well, there's those special sins that are like really, really bad that make kind of like a really hard to live a Christian life. But I, I only, I guess I gossip a little bit. Well, your religion is worthless. Well done. This is how serious the word is, and that's what I'm saying, like, this is not a, well, yeah, but my sins are special. My sins are not as bad. My guess is that at least half of you struggle with gossip in a serious way. My guess is the, <laughs> I know because I was talking to Judy the, earlier, and she said, <laughs> the, but the other part is, is this, is that um, the other half of us struggles with complaining. None of us, hardly any of us bridle our tongues. We say whatever we want to say. We say whatever we're feeling. We say our opinions without even stopping to ask if those opinions are true. We even say, I'm going to tell the truth. I don't care. You know, you just need to hear it. You just need to hear it. No, bridle your tongue. You know what that means? It means like, like a horse and bridle. You've got to put the bridle on there and like give it some direction. I mean, no, I just need to say the truth. You know what? I just need to, I just need to tell them. I just need to tell them. Here's the thing. I'm going to go up. I'm going to meet with them, and I'm just going to tell them. I'm going to tell them where they're wrong. Religion is vain. And this is this one of the things, that's, this is one of the major reasons why it's not us and them. We are all in the same boat. Because every single one of us has some kind of besetting thing in our lives. And man, I remember um, reading this, but also it was my personal experience. This one young man, he uh, said, Father Mike, I want to talk with you about this big thing. And, and so we did, and he, he said, well, I'm, I'm gay. And I said, okay. Uh, my response was, well, because he thought it was, he was going to devastate me. He thought it was going to be like, you're not, he's not going to be able to handle this. And I was like, I mean, it's a big deal. I'm, I appreciate it. I, I was honored that he shared this with me. But he thought that it would devastate me. My main thing was, like, well, 
dude, if it wasn't this, it'd be something else. If this wasn't your struggle, it would be something else. And I know him, and I, this particular man, I know he struggles, he experiences anxiety, experiences depression, experiences the other, some of these other areas of his life of, of woundedness or brokenness. And yeah, so this is another piece, and I, I, I thank you for letting me in on that. I thank you for sharing that with me. More than this, it'd be something else. I don't know how many times in the confessional, well, you know, someone will come in and they'll, 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 they'll confess some kind of struggle with some kind of sexual sin. And he's like, oh, I'm so, and it, yeah, if it wasn't this, it'd be something else. I know people who have, like, they've, they've been, like, completely delivered from some kind of major besetting sin that just, just, like, hammered them again and again their whole life. And then they, you know, they came to the Lord and, like, they just said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stop that thing. And they put it off to the side. And then, no, it doesn't even touch them. It doesn't even affect them. It doesn't even enter into their, like, daily consciousness. But now they struggle with pride. Because you can't just put it off to the side and, like, just stop doing the thing you're doing. Like, what's wrong with you? Okay, now, so now your new besetting sin is worse than the first one. So well done. I'm really proud of you. Um, because here's the thing. I get, let's come down to the main thing is this. It's, we're not going to, as, as I'm going to be discussing, it is not about them. It's never, it can never be. And if it ever is about them, then we're making the wrong words, and I need to bridle my mouth. Because this conversation is all about us. And for far, far, far too long, I think even this morning's conversation was a little bit almost, I felt so badly at the end, because I was like, I've, we've been talking so much about them, and those people who want to advance this position, and those people experience, and that's just, that's just the wrong way to do it. I think it's the wrong way to do it. I liked, I appreciated the conversation this morning, but to me it just almost, I felt like I, I did it the wrong way. It's never about us, it's never about them, it's about us. So how do we have the conversation, not just the conversation, because talk is nice, but walking is more important. So how do we walk, as it says in the title, how do we walk with our brothers and sisters, those who belong, part of us, part of our families, part of our friendship, part of the church, who experience same-sex attraction, regardless of whether they're acting out or not. Number one, the first B is be second. Be second. Number two. No, that's not number two. That, that's number one is number two, right? Just kidding, you guys. I've, number one is be second. Here's what I mean. When we're, I think, sorry, when I say we, I'm probably talking about me. So, you know how we are when we talk with people, how jerky we are? Right. Like, no, what I want to do when I'm ca talking with someone and I know the answer is I don't need to hear you anymore because, no, no, I know your question already, so I'm just going to give you my answer. I know your question is probably why, blah, 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 blah. So I hear, here's my answer. And so what I'm doing is I'm first. I'm going to put myself first. And yet, you probably, those of you who are good at, convert, at, at relationships, you're good at communication, you know, no, 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 don't be first, be second. And this, this idea of, the truth is, I need to listen to you if I'm going to have anything to say to you. For a number of reasons. But the first one is this. I come upon someone, and they say, I have a question about blank, whatever blank is. And I say, oh, oh, here, uh, let me tell you all that I know about blank. And I can be completely off the target, as in a thought I have, would have is this. Um, I live in Duluth, Minnesota, and imagine someone called me up and said, Father Mike, how do I get to um, Minneapolis-St. Paul? How do I get to St. Paul? Oh, easy. Yeah, I mean, just drive um, south on 21st Avenue, and then you take a right onto 35E, and you're going south, um, and then you uh, take another left, and then drive about 12 miles, and then take another right, and then you drive about t uh, 112 more miles, and then you take a left when you, after that. And they're like, okay, I'm currently in Fargo. <laughs> okay, so what I need to do is, I'm giving them my directions. So here's how I would get from where I am to St. Paul. I don't know where you are until you tell me where you are. And so if I'm going to give anyone any kind of guidance, any kind of feedback, any kind of direction, where are you right now? And I can't know that unless I'm willing to listen to them. I need to be second. I can't be first. I need to be second. So again, when it comes to listening, be second. When it comes to walking, be second. Because we need to listen. Need to listen um, because I don't know where they are 
Another reason I need to listen is because um, I don't know what they care about. I don't, I don't, I'm not, not only do I not know where you are, I don't know what you care about. Someone can, I mean, you've probably had this when it comes to apologetics. Someone says, so what's up with this belief in purgatory? And they're like, oh, no, no, it's okay. It's because it's a scripture. And da, da, da. They're like, I don't care about scripture. I just want to know, do I have to go there? <laughs> or I just want to know, how painful is it? You know, I just, I need to know what they care about. I need to listen. I, wanna, I need to be second because I need to listen. But another thing is this. It's just, it's respectful. When you're, when I'm not first, but I'm going to be second, and I'm going to say, and I need to listen to you, what I'm trying to communicate is this. You have something to teach me. I have something to learn from you. Particularly if you're like, no, 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 I've read all these books about this and this, and I know why this is wrong, why this is good, and why this is supposed to be the best thing in the world. We can jump down to that as opposed to, you know what, you have something to teach me. I think one of the, one of the, the things I've heard so many times from our brothers and sisters who experience same-sex attraction is, after I give a whole presentation, well, yeah, but do you know anyone who's gay? Well, yeah. Okay, yeah, but have you ever really talked with someone? Have you been in their lives? Yes. Are you willing, and then the next, are you willing to be in my life? Are you willing to let me teach you something? Yeah. So if I'm going to be second, that means, that means I have something to learn from you. I have something to learn from you. You can teach me something. And if we have the attitude of be first, then we, we're wrong. We're just, we're just wrong. So I need to be second. I need to listen. I need to have the attitude. I can learn something from you. How, the, how far this goes. A couple weeks ago, I was giving a talk in Halifax, Nova Scotia at a Steubenville conference. And I gave a talk on this topic. But it was on just here's the church's teaching with this regard. After the talk, two young women came up to me and they talked about, they said, expressed how they experienced feelings of transgender feelings about themselves. And I sit down and, well, tell me, you know, what do you mean you, you feel like you're not really a girl? What do you mean you, you feel like you're asexual? What do you mean you feel like you're a boy? These two different girls. And not like, what do you mean you feel like a boy? <laughs> it's more like, oh, okay, well, just tell me more. You have something to teach me. I don't know what that is to feel like that. I know what it is to feel like a boy. I, I don't know what it is to have a woman's body, but to feel not like a woman. So tell me your experience. Not just because I need to know so I can give you an answer, but I need to, I want to know because you have something to teach me that I don't know. But if I'm going to be first, then I can't be taught. Be second. Does that make sense? Number, number one, be, be, number one, be second. Number two, um, be close. Be close. Uh, there's a buddy of mine, his name's Any Hickman. And any, he works some of the Steubenville stuff. Any is an awesome guy. He lives down in Texas. And he has this, this thing he calls, a, a ministry he calls Love Your Neighbor. Love Your Neighbor Ministries. And he, his theory is this. He says, I believe that when Jesus said, love your neighbor, he actually meant it. He meant, like, love the person who lives next door to you. <laughs> love your actual neighbor. And we're like, oh, no, love your neighbor. That means I don't have to love anybody. <laughs> that means I just kind of tolerate people out there. Like, oh, you're my neighbor. Hey, neighbor, I won't get in your way. <laughs> I'm American, you know? <laughs> like... Because that's what we sometimes think of as freedom is like, you have the freedom to do what you, ought, you want to do, I'm not going to get in your way. But love your neighbor is actually love your neighbor. If my neighbor is in distress, then it's my job to go take care of my literal neighbor. And so there's this thing called the 10-foot rule. And the 10-foot rule is I can only really love someone within 10 feet of them. I can only really love someone if I'm actually in their life. So I always get the question, Father, can I go to my, you know, my uh, lesbian aunt's wedding? Because I feel like if I don't go, here's the thing. Because I feel if I don't go, that I'll just, she'll feel like I'm rejecting her. I feel like if I don't go, there'll be all these, these bad feelings. I feel like if I don't go, I need to, I need to, I want to let her know that she's still in my life. I want to let her know that I want to be in her life. And like, okay, these are two different things. You can be in her life and not go to the wedding. You can go to the wedding and not be in her life. Two different things. And the Catholic Christian is called to be in her life and not go to the wedding. But I can only really love someone if I'm within 10 feet of them, essentially. It's a figurative 10 feet. But the idea is like, oh, oh, got it, okay. I can only really love someone if I'm close, to be close to them. That means I care about them. Does that make sense? 
So, be second, be close. Number three, be clear. Be clear. What I mean about be clear is this. I need to be crystal clear on what the church's teaching is in this regard. I need to be crystal clear on what the church's teaching is in this regard. And I need to be crystal clear on why the church teaches what she teaches in this regard. Here's why. Here's why I need to be clear. Because if I'm not clear, if I'm not, if I don't fully understand, a number of things are going to happen. If I'm not clear, I will end up being brittle where I could be flexible. If I don't know really what the church teaches, I want to make up all these rules that I, I bet it's probably against church teaching for X, Y, and Z. If I don't know why the church teaches it, I will end up make up all these rules in my head of like, here's where I can't go, here's what I can do. For example, when it comes to being clear, why did I say, why would I say that it's against our faith to attend a same-sex wedding? Well, because of this. Because we believe that a wedding is not something, something, something people simply watch. Because you never watch Mass. You don't just go to Mass and watch Mass. You're an active participant in Mass. If you show up at a Mass, you are participating in the Mass. If you show up at a wedding, you are a, not just watching the wedding, you're a witness to the wedding. You're participating in the wedding. You're not just a passive observer. We believe, our, kind of our theology is, you're a part of that event. You're not just watching, you're a witness. And so you're like, no, no, I, I'm against it personally, but I want to be there to support them. So if you show up, what you'd have to do, I want to make it clear, I'm not, I'm, I'm not here to, to endorse what you're doing, but I want to support Judy and Jane. If you really want to do that, that would mean you have to show up and then let everyone know why you're there and what you're opposed to. And that's just rude. That's not good manners. <laughs> Going to everyone, hi, I'm here for Judy because I like her a lot, but I don't endorse her wedding with Jill. Like, <laughs> no, don't do that. Rather than, here's the thing, why would I not be allowed to attend a same-sex wedding? Because weddings, you witness. You're a part of it actively. So, Father, can I go to the reception afterwards? Prudential decision. But there are some cases when you could say, yeah, I would, I would do that. Prudential decision. How is it different? Well, unless I know the difference between the wedding and the reception, <laughs> unless I'm clear, be clear, remember? Unless I'm clear on the difference between a wedding and a wedding reception, I will not be able to know the difference here. But if I do know the difference, then I can say, there are some cases when it might be permissible to go to a wedding reception. I have a, I have a brother priest, and his sister uh, had a same-sex wedding. And the whole family, they're very devout Catholic, and they're like, we can't go to the wedding, but they're like, but we're going to go to the reception because we know it's important to you. We're going to go to the reception, and here we are, here for you, because it's a big day for you. You know, by our absence at the wedding, where we stand. So we don't have to make a big deal about it now that we're here at the reception. Because we're just here because we love our daughter. Because we love our sister. That's not the same thing as endorsing and witnessing the wedding. But unless I'm clear, I will be brittle where I could possibly be flexible. I don't know if that makes sense. But get, here's where it gets kind of muddy. But again, let's go back. It's all going to be common sense. It's all going to be common sense when it comes down to it. Right, right here. So I need to be clear. I need to know the what and the why. Another example. Some of these things are just completely prudential judgments. So, here we are. It's 4th of July, a couple years ago. And my family member, who had recently come out of the closet, I, if you want to use that phrase, had recently come out, and he says, hey, um, I'm seeing someone, and I want to know, uh, we're, can we, is it okay if we come up for 4th of July to the lake? In Minnesota, everyone, like, goes... Everyone lives in the Twin Cities, but they all want to live in the lake. So it's like, let's come to the lake. Absolutely you can. Can Sean come too? Absolutely you can. Because wh why? Well, he's, you, you guys are like dating. Yep. And you're welcome to invite any of your friends to your parents' place for the weekend. That's no problem. Now, the great thing is my parents have always had the rule that uh, no matter how long you've been dating, no matter where you're at in stage in your relationship, unless you're married, you're not sleeping in the same room. 
that was really easy for them to enforce. <laughs> like, here's the thing. It's like, no, you know the rules. And family members are like, yep, I know the rule. It's not a, it's not a surprise. I'm not being treated specially. Like, I'm just, that's the rule. Um, my parents have always had a kind of a pretty good rule about public displays of affection. So, yeah, just there it is. Continuation of the rule. Same kind of thing. It's this flexibility and being able to say, you can come, you can show up at our house with this person that you're dating. And we will welcome you into the home with joy. We welcome you into the home with joy. I first heard that by Father John Harvey. Father John Harvey is the founder of Courage. I went to this talk when I was in seminary, and someone said, okay, here's Ralph and here's George. Ralph is my son, and, and George is his boyfriend. Um, he wants to come home for Thanksgiving, but he'll only come home if Ralph can come with him for Thanksgiving. Should I say no? Like, no, these are the rules. Like, you can come home, Ralph. I don't, I forget who, which child is which. Um, my child is George. His boyfriend is Ralph. Okay, you can only come home, George, if Ralph doesn't. And Father Harvey said, never do that. Father Harvey said, yes, of course, you have rules in your home. That's your home. You have rules in your home. They can't sleep in the same bed, public space affection, all these kind of things. But he said this. He said, there's so much, there's so much isolation already experienced by men and women who experience same-sex attraction. So much isolation already. So much, if not actual, at least perceived rejection that when you say, okay, yeah, George, you can come home only if Ralph doesn't come, what you're going to do is you're going to be putting up, building up a wall. Father Harvey said he's seen it so many times in his own experience of ministering with men and women who ex have this experience. He says, at some point, this whole lifestyle breaks apart. At some point, there's this desire, I want to go back to my family. And he said, but if you've been building these walls, you can come home only if, where are they going to go? Not home. But if you've been having open doors, and like, yes, you can always come home. Yep, if Ralph's coming too, no problem. You can always come home. There's rules, of course, but if you want to come home, there's, there's a home you have. With open doors, that means that experience, that wound of isolation that you've experienced, that wound of rejection, again, whether perceived or real, is going to be healed. And it also creates a certain cognitive dissonance when you're clear, when you're clear. So here's an example, same example that of the 4th of July thing, is back in 2012, Minnesota had a thing called the marriage amendment up on the, on the ballot. And so everyone, everyone in the world in Minnesota had these lawn signs. And there was all these vote no lawn signs for don't restrict the freedom to marry. So vote no. And then, so basically only Catholics, more or less, and some evangelicals had lawn signs that said vote yes, vote yes to keep the traditional definition of marriage. And um, so my parents had the vote yes signed in the front yard. And it was so interesting because Sean, the boyfriend, would pull into the driveway, and he'd say, like, okay, I don't get it. And my family members would say, what do you mean you don't get it? Well, I, I, don't, I, I, just, I, I, I don't understand. Like, your family, like, seems to, like, really love me. Yeah, they totally do. But then I see the signs in the yard. I'm like, you can't possibly love me. No, they, they, they do. <laughs> and there's this great cognitive dissonance of, like, coming to the family. Oh, absolutely, come into the home. Because there's rules. We don't have to go through them every time you come visit. Like, and by the way, no smooching, no whatever. Like, <laughs> come into the home and you're completely, I feel completely welcomed. I feel like your family completely loves me. And yet here's the lawn sign that says you don't want me to, you don't think I should be able to get married to a member of the same sex. Yes. When you're clear, you can say both things. And it might ca cause cognitive dissonance, but there's a clarity there. Now, if questions come up out of that, that's why we have the Q&A session. So, B, second, be close, be clear, be kind. Number four, be kind. Be kind. One of the reasons to be kind is because we have no idea, we have no idea a person's story. It is far, far better, I think, so many ways to be kind than it is to say, you know, I just got to be honest. Sometimes we always have to be honest. You have to tell the truth. But to be kind when we do it. Because sometimes people are wounded in ways we didn't expect. So here's a quick little story. It doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about, but except for being kind. Um, years ago, when I was in the seminary, I was in a pro program called CPE, Clinical Pastoral Education, where you went into a hospital, and they trained you as a chaplain. And so um, there were a bunch of us. There was a couple Baptists, a couple Catholics, a couple Methodists, a couple Lutherans, and a bunch of Lutherans who were in Minnesota. And 
um, the, the head person, uh, she was a Lutheran pastor. And so it's all good. It's going, throughout, going well throughout the whole summer. We were supposed to lead a Lutheran communion service on Sundays. Like at least one Sunday of summer, every one of us had to lead a Lutheran communion service. And so my summer that was scheduled, my weekend, I mean, that was scheduled, she was going to be gone. So I'm like, oh, perfect. I'll just lead a service of the word. I can, I can do that as a, as a Catholic seminarian. I can lead a, a word service. No big deal. And then, so I said, uh, hey, Linda, is it okay that since you'll be gone that weekend anyways, uh, I just lead the service of the word because I can't, I can't be part of a, a non-Catholic communion service. I can't, like, officiate at a non-Catholic communion service. And, and it's, it's perfect because you're, you're not even going to be there, so it's, it's all taken care of. You don't have to worry about anything. As a result of that, we had a, the entire team had a three-hour meeting where it was, I was on the hot seat, and it was like, how dare you say that you will not be part of our com interfaith communion service? How dare you say that you're not willing to be part of this um, interfaith communion service? How dare you? And I'm like, what? And all you even the Catholics are like, I can't believe you're doing this. You're, I'm like, I just, it's just the rule. Like, I didn't make it up. <laughs> I just can't do that. And it went round and around. And I even would say things like, um, wait, if I was Jewish, would you force me to pray in the name of Jesus? Oh, no, but this is totally different. I'm like, how <laughs> is this totally different? I mean, it's even like the thing of like, Linda, at some point, did you choose to be Lutheran? Yes. So you chose not to be Catholic? Yes. So you already made the dividing wall. Like, the dividing wall has existed when we showed up this summer. Yes. But she was still mad. And so finally, after three hours, I finally caught on. And I said, Linda, it sounds like you're just personally offended by this. She stopped. She said, well, yeah, I guess I am. I was like, oh, oh, okay. Um, then I'm sorry. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> all, all that she wanted in some, some ways was she wanted an apology. Because she felt hurt by this. She felt personally hurt. All the, all, the, all the logical reasons why, like, it's already, we're already divided. We showed up and we said, I'm Baptist, I'm Catholic, I'm Lutheran. We already showed up like this. The fact that we're just living it out now didn't matter. The matter was she was hurt by it for some reason. And so to be kind with people is to take into account that sometimes we're just, sometimes we hurt each other and we didn't even mean to. And I didn't even think, I didn't even think I hurt you. It doesn't matter. If you're hurt, then you're hurt. I need to be kind. That's, that's one of the things I, I've, I've learned again and again. I mentioned this thing about um, whether it's actual or perceived rejection, it doesn't matter in some ways because it, I still feel rejected. Whether I was actually rejected or I merely perceived being rejected, in some ways for us, it doesn't matter because the feeling is I don't belong here. We need, again, that fourth thing, to be kind. Why? Um, that I shared this a couple times this summer with youth conferences, but it was really hard to share. Um, so, with my Minnesota accent, so uh, um, I was speaking with this person I love very much, and he was saying, this is like a month ago, two months ago. And we were talking about tattoos. And neither of us have tattoos. And he was like, I said, hey, bud, would you, ever get, 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 would you ever get a tattoo? And he's like, yeah, I think I would. I was like, what would you get? And he said, I think I'd get a swan. <laughs> so I started making fun of him. I'm like, what swan? Oh, my gosh, yeah. And I'd get the karate kid, and we'd have the crane technique and the swan. And I'm like... So, and then, but then actually he started describing, explaining why, and I started crying, and I'm like, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm really, he said this, he said, because my whole life growing up, I felt different than everyone else. So my whole life growing up, I look around and everyone seems like a duck. And all the guys like all the girls, and all the girls like all the guys, and I'm like, I'm, I'm not like that. And he's like, I, my whole life, felt just like I didn't fit, like there was something profoundly wrong with me, like wrong with me, not just wrong with the, I, I'm attracted this way or that way, but there's something like I, di I didn't belong. And then he said when he was 27, that's when he finally acknowledged out loud to me, to anyone, you know, I'm, I'm gay. He 
experience it in that did I experience this like oh and I met other people who had the same experience I'm like oh wait so you're so we're all like e we're like each other like I'm not I'm not the ugly duckling I'm actually just I'm a swan and I would argue of course with the ontological thing about this I would argue with that but that was not the moment to argue because unless you bridle your mouth your religion is in vain I was just there to listen to this guy talk and say I've always felt like I didn't fit in. I'm like, I, here his brother is a priest talking about this stuff all the time. I mean, he's one of our students on the college campus and I'd be preaching about same-sex attraction in a way that I think is like, oh, super compassionate and super patient and super kind. And the whole time he's sitting there thinking, see, I don't fit. I don't belong. And this person is someone that I, when I was 12 years old, and he was two, I'd said, I'm going to spend my life for him. I don't know why. He was two, and I was 12. And he felt like he didn't belong. I would say, I never rejected you. It doesn't matter. Because he felt rejected. Say, dude, you always belong. That's important, but in some ways it doesn't matter because he didn't feel like he belonged. So that's step four. That ne ne it's ne absolutely necessary to be kind. You have no idea. No idea what someone's perception of our... It, it would come up, you know, I'd watch a certain movie and like, ah, it was good except for this one scene where they included this whole homosexual relationship thing and that's like, ah, it just bothers me. Here I am saying this. Now if I'm talking to someone who doesn't experience that, we're just talking. But now I'm talking to my little brother who experiences this and he's told nobody his whole life. And he's like, okay, mental note. Don't tell Michael that. Rule number four for walking with our brothers and sisters is just be kind. Because we have no idea. So, be second, be close, be clear, be kind, be patient. Be patient. Uh, at apologetic conferences, hopefully we reiter reiterate this again and again and again and again, is that it's never about winning an argument. Like Dr. Sri said last night, like I, I said to my, my philosophy roommate, student, like, you know, there's no, no such thing as absolute truth. Well, is that absolutely true? Ha, I gotcha. One, did I win? I didn't win. Be patient in the sense of this, is that we're all on this, like, we're all somewhere in our relationship with the Lord. We're all somewhere in our relationship with the truth. We're all somewhere in our relationship of, of, with, with, with love himself. And I imagine this. I imagine if anyone were to come around, along any one of our lives and just take a snapshot of any one moment of any one of our lives, you'd say, if, that, if my whole life is that one snapshot, my life was a tragedy. My life was like, wow, what a profound sinner. Well, that person is so far away from the Lord. Wow, they're in, in great rejection. Of, that's a great comedy. That's a great rom. But to recognize that if I'm going to be in this person's life, if I'm going to be close, if I'm going to put them first and I'll be second, I need to be patient. Because people say, like, well, so how, where's your brother right now? Where, how is he at when it comes to the faith? And how is he at when it comes to this and that? Like, I'll say this. I'll say that, A, that's his business. Thank you for asking, though. B, of course I did just talk about him. But B, um, I'll say that he knows Jesus is God. He knows that Jesus founded the Catholic Church. He knows the Eucharist is truly the Lord of the universe. Occasionally text and say, hey, just coming back from confession. Then I'm going off to this church, at, you know, go, going to Mass tonight or tomorrow morning, whatever. Same time, I'm talking, he's like, yeah, I went on a date with this guy last week. <laughs> Patient. You know why? Take a snapshot of my life in any given moment. You guys would ball your eyes out. <laughs> or throw up. 
take a snapshot the next moment, you're like, whoa, that guy should be a saint. You've got to be patient with each other. And it's far, far more important to win the heart and the trust of someone than it is to win an argument. Far, far more important to win the trust and the heart of someone than to win an argument. I can only win someone's heart for Jesus if I'm willing to be patient with them. If I'm willing to be second, to be close, to be clear, to be kind, and to be patient. The sixth B is, um, <laughs> I'll say it in just a second. I know we read a lot of books. When you're at a Defending the Faith conference, we, we study a lot, and we want to know the answer. We want to be strong in our faith. We want to be like confident and competent about our answers, about what we know to be true. And, and, and we, we know this, right? The church, in the church, subsists the fullness of truth. We, we know this is true. So we can be really strong. Have you ever known a Catholic who is too strong in their defense of the faith? So this, I'm going to do one of these. You ever know a Catholic who is too strong in their defense of the faith? This one, I invite you to raise it high. Have you ever been that Catholic that was too strong in their defense of the faith? Yes. Same here. But Jesus was strong. Yes, he was, absolutely. He went into that temple, took out the whip of cords. He went up to the Pharisees, grew to vipers, whitewashed tombs. Outside, you're awesome. Inside, you're dead men's bones and full of filth. He was strong. And he, he was the truth. <laughs> For crying out loud. Sorry, is current tense. He is the truth. <laughs> but we need to be more like Jesus because he was strong, but he was vulnerable. Be vulnerable. Be vulnerable. We have so many gifts from the church, from the Lord, when it comes to truth, when it comes to prayer, when it comes to being able to express these kinds of things. We can be so strong, and we can forget in our strength that we need to be vulnerable. Jesus was strong, but he was willing to be destroyed for love of the people who were destroying him. And unless I'm willing to be destroyed for love of the people that are destroying me, I should keep my sh mouth shut. Unless I'm willing to actually suffer for the people to whom I'm speaking, I should keep my mouth shut. Unless I'm willing to actually be vulnerable to the very people that I want to win their hearts and win their trust, if unless I'm willing, and I, if I can't do that, I should keep my mouth shut and not say anything, ever, until I'm willing to actually be hurt and suffer for the people that I'm trying to convince. So, yeah, I need to be strong, but I, we have to be vulnerable. Able to be hurt. Able to be wounded. And not come from a place of defensiveness. So often we come from this place of defensiveness. I need to hold my ground. I need to hold my ground. I need to hold my ground. There's a line. But when it comes down to it, in so, so many ways, the person's more valuable. Not more valuable than the truth, but more valuable than the win. More valuable than me winning this moment. For that moment, I need to be vulnerable. And the last B is the first B. I need to treat people like they belong. Not like they have to first prove themselves and then they can belong. There's a whole uh, thing, I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, Father James Mallon and the book Divine Renovation. But one of the things he point, points out in this book is he points out that for a, in recent years, our mentality as Catholics is if you believe and then you behave, then you belong. You believe what we believe, awesome. Now you behave how we want you to behave, great. Now you belong. And what he says is if, if, as we go out into the world, we have to reverse that. That first, we want to let you know, you actually are you're part of us. You belong. From that will flow this belief in the Lord. And from that will flow 
Jesus behaving in a certain way, like your heart gets conformed to him, but it starts with belonging. It ends with belonging. There's that kind of sense. So how do we communicate to our brothers and sisters that actually I'm more, I am in some ways more interested right now in you recognizing and realizing you belong than I am in knowing what you believe and how you behave. That matters. I'm not saying it doesn't. But I'm saying is what's my priority? My priority is going to be, I'm going to be second. I'm going to be clear, close. I'm going to be clear. I'm going to be kind. <laughs> I'm going to be patient with me as well. I'm vulnerable. And I want to let you know that you belong. 